Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Outfront Full Circle, UNH LGBTQ plus historical perspectives. We are so thrilled to see you all here. Well, we can't, technically can't see you at all, unfortunately, but you'll see us and we are thrilled that you're joining us. I'm going to introduce myself and I see the counter is ratcheting up. So we will allow folks to get in before we get into the program uh, as a whole. But my name is Carrie Moorhead, she, her, hers. I am the Dean at the Graduate School at the University of New Hampshire. And it's my honor to be here tonight. Uh, we will begin by having our panelists introduce themselves briefly, and then I will come back and explain how the rest of the program is going to go. So we'll start with you, Wayne. Wayne. You, oh, I'm sorry. Did she introduce? Okay. Yeah, you froze. We lost part of your introduction, Carrie. <laughs> oh, no. So I just said, uh, we'll just go around and introduce ourselves briefly and I'll start with Wayne. Okay, uh, I'm Wayne April. I graduated in 74 and uh, I founded the uh, Gay Students Organization, which we call the GSO um, in 1973. And uh, we went through a lot of uh, controversy and publicity and uh, which resulted in uh, a landmark case in federal law that allows gay student organizations to exist on college campuses with all the full rights of any other student organization. So I feel pretty proud about that. And that's it. Well, we're going to hear a lot more about Wayne's work and uh, Paul. My name is Paul Primo Tosi. I was student body president in 1973, class of 74. Um, and uh, Wayne is very understated in, in, in what they did, but that issue became the predominant issue of the year that I was student body president. And to, just to give you an idea, when I campaigned to be student body president, I campaigned on a couple of issues. One, legal representation for the university students. Two, a gynecologist for the student infirmary because we had no women's health in the student infirmary. And so things changed dramatically in February of 1973, not only for the, uh, for the university, but for me, because there was an awakening in me that changed my entire life. I am now a, uh, a very proud gay man who has been with his husband for 40 years and, uh, and I couldn't be happier with my life. I've continued to be active in all kinds of issues. All have one common thread. It's a thread that I talked about in 1973 when I spoke to the board of trustees. It's all human rights, my friends. It's all human rights. Thank you. So um, I think, why don't we just stay with Wayne and Paul for a minute? So Wayne, let's tell the audience who may not be as familiar you're at UNH, you're looking for this group to join, you, you try to get some folks together and you're ready to, to go with your paperwork and you want to make this official. So can you walk us through basically what happened and then, uh, yeah, okay. unpack it a little bit for us. Well, unfortunately, I drew up a little timeline finally because it was all muddled in my head. It's been so long. Um, and coincidentally, today is the 48th anniversary of the day that uh, 10 other students and myself met with the editor of the student newspaper uh, for the initial article about our group about gays on campus. And uh, it was published uh, a few days later in the New Hampshire. And that start, really started the ball rolling on everything because that committed us. Four of us volunteered to use our names in the newspaper article. And um, that was quite a commitment uh, on all of us. And so we felt obligated to start the organization <laughs> after all that. We figured if we were gonna be controversial, we might as well do something uh, to benefit from it. So um, it all really started from letters to the editor. The New Hampshire kept getting letters to the editor from anonymous sources, uh, people that used uh, pseudonyms 
to ask about why there wasn't more being done on campus for gay students. And uh, several people asked why there couldn't be a special edition of the New Hampshire about gays like they, they had done previously on women and blacks. Um, but nobody would sign their name. Nobody gave contact information. And so I called, we discussed this among ourselves, my friends and I, and we said, well, why don't they do something? And so I volunteered to contact the editor. I called and I said, you know, what is it that you're going to do or what, what do you want us to do? Um, he said, well, so far, nobody's given me a contact number. So I have no way of contacting anybody to start anything. Are you willing to meet with me? And I said, sure. He says, can you get some people together? I said, I'll try. And uh, I got 10 people to join me out in Barrington where I was living at the time. And he came out and interviewed us and which resulted in the article. So then we formed the, the Gay Students Organization and uh, uh, it all took off from there. Uh, we, we sponsored a dance uh, not too long after that. And that caused uh, a big flare up in Concord, Manchester, because um, we had done a social activity, which the um, governor and the owner of the Manchester Union Le leader thought was the beginning of Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah on earth. <laughs> And they went to court. Uh, Meldrum Thompson, the governor, is a, a trustee uh, of the UNH trustees. Um, I think he's an ex officio member or something like that. Um, and he started getting the trustees riled up and he wanted to file a suit uh, preventing the recognition or de-reckoning de the uh, GSO as a student organization. And they went to court for that. So that's when we started the whole courtroom scenario. They, they filed um, something in the state courts and then they filed something in the federal court. Um, it was appealed to the federal court in Boston, the, the Court of Appeals. Um, and that's where we won. And the trustees lost. And the trustees ultimately decided not to pursue it any further, even though um, the governor wanted to. And uh, that, that provided the precedent that other students uh, used on other campuses to get their own organizations recognized. So um, we sponsored several other activities after that, which caused a lot of controversy. We sponsored uh, a play called Coming Out, which was uh, popular at the time. Uh, and uh, a bunch of people came up from Boston to support us. <laughs> including people that worked for a newspaper called The Fag Rag. And uh, that was distributed free to anybody at the play. That caused a controversy when the trustees got a hold of a copy because it was pretty out there. And, um, you know, that shocked the sensibilities of some people. And they tried to blame us for it, even though we had nothing to do with it. Uh, so basically, by the time it was all over with, uh, we had won the court case. Um, the governor and the Manchester Union leader kind of retreated because some of us had graduated and uh, the things calmed down a little bit. And plus, I think the GSO kind of took a hiatus for a short time before some new people took it over. So that's in a thumbnail sketch uh, what we did. I'm going to come back in a minute. Um around some of your uh, tactics may be the right word. And I want to in, invite Paul uh, to, to talk about his role in all of this at the time. And uh, how, how did you see this, Paul? You're the student uh, body president at the time. Well, what Wayne doesn't mention is that any student organization, in order to be recognized, has to meet certain criteria. They have to have a constitution. They have to have bylaws. They have to have all, they have to dot all the, I's and cross all the T's. And we had an organization that was made up of members of the uh, Memorial Union, people from the student union and people from student government that had to review documentation presented by a student organization. And many times those student organizations got denied because they didn't cross all the T's and dot all the I's. Wayne did. And the simple thing was when it came before that board, all the T's were crossed, all the I's were dotted. They had met every criteria to be a recognized student organization on the university campus. And the uh, committee unanimously voted to approve them as a student organization. That was presented to the university administration. 
and the university administration said showed no reason why they couldn't do it and, and agreed with it. And that's when the front page headline occurred in the Manchester Union leader, booed out the pansies, and the governor issued his letter saying he wanted all the sexual deviants and perverts arrested and removed from campus to the fullest extent of the law. Uh, yeah, that too. <laughs> yeah, that too. What Wayne, what Wayne, every battle was won by this group. Every legal battle was won in the state Supreme Court, in Superior Court, and in the federal courts. Every battle was won. The university lost big time because the governor did succeed in slamming the university budget, cutting millions of dollars out of state aid to education as, as, as his revenge. But I remember distinctly in May of 1973, the board of trustees, 24 distinguished people from all over the state of New Hampshire, most of them senior citizens led by uh, Mildred McAfee Horton, 75 years old, former, dean, former president of Wellesley University, former uh, commandant of the waves, the first commandant of the waves under Franklin Delano Roosevelt, delegate to the ecumenical council in the Vatican in the 60s, a member of the board of, uh, board of the Pres Presbyterian Church of America, fought for and got women in the ministry fought for and got equal pay for women in the military in 1946. Mildred was the chairman of the board and we were gonna lose big time, there's no doubt. But the entire Dean of Students, the Vice Provost, the Dean all worked, started beginning lobbying these trustees. And what I call my true 15 minutes of fame is a picture that is indelibly imprinted on my mind of me addressing the board of trustees. Wayne is sitting almost directly behind me along with the full complement of the gay student organization. And my whole address was about human rights. Dick Stevens, who was the vice provost for student affairs spoke, the Dean of Students, I mean, it was a, it was a bombardment presentation. And the Board of Trustees voted 23 to 1 in favor of supporting the gay student organization. Now, down the road, the governor won, and that's what ended up with the federal court case and everything. But the bottom line is, no matter what happened, and the dance, which was in Stratford Room, and is another defining moment of my life, as I stood there with the Dean of Students and watched this, and I turned to her and I said, uh, this is no different than any other dance I've been to. I mean, it's just, it's just people dancing. What's the big deal about? All of that led to, to my life awakening, but um, sometimes you, you know, there, there are all, there's always sacrifice. And like I said, we won every battle. In many respects, the war, far from over, but for UNH, financially was devastating. It took us years to recover from what the governor did. But think, do some history. Look at the political landscape in New Hampshire since then. Significantly different, significantly more open, significantly better journalism. A world of difference. And I attribute an awful lot of it to an awakening that began in the early 70s in UNH. There was a lot going on then. I mean, there was the women, women libbers, there was the black student union working on campus. Uh, the Vietnam War protests were in full swing. Uh, Nixon was on the verge of uh, resigning or being impeached before he resigned. I mean, it was a lot was going on. Then the Kent State massacre and classes were canceled. And it was just crazy, crazy time. Um, we were just really a small part of it. But I feel that, uh, you know, I changed the direction of my life. And because up until that time, I was, I kind of felt like I was a bridge between the old gay community and the newer gay community because the gays that I had met up and through my coming out years um, were kind of the old guard. Um, there was a lot of heavy, heavy drinking, um, a lot of uh, self hatred. Um, 
self-destructive behavior. Um, it was just seemed to be part and parcel of being gay. And I, and I looked at that and I thought, there's got to be another way. There's got to be another option uh, because this isn't going to sustain me. So. So thank you both so much for being here tonight, for going back down memory lane in this way. And of course, thank you both particularly for the work. And this work is work that we all stand on now. And that's one of the great exciting things to me about this conversation that we're having because we want to show how we stand on the shoulders of those who've come before and one of the ways we tie this uh, through Wayne is uh, we'd love you to tell us the story about that tactic I mentioned was you were trying to get to meet with the governor and there was a pancake breakfast involved could you tell us that story <laughs> well uh, the TV station, which I don't know if it's still called WENH, um, was having its first fundraising auction. And um, one of the items up for auction that were donated was from the governor's mansion, um, a pancake breakfast at his farm in Orford um, with pancakes and, and maple syrup made from his own trees. <laughs> so uh, somebody got wind of it and told the GSO about it and said, you guys should bid on this. And one of our members, Lou Kelly, uh, really took the bull by the horns and ran around campus telling everybody about this item we wanted to bid on. And people started giving him money so that we'd have the money to bid on it. And he says, they're practically throwing it at me. <laughs> he was so excited. And I think he raised over $1,000. Um, and so we started bidding on it. And uh, we were the lead bidders. Nobody expected it to go for that much money. And then suddenly um, the bidding stopped without warning and one of the governor's supporters won the breakfast. And it was no secret to most people what had happened. Uh, somebody had gotten wind of what was happening. There was no way they were, they were gonna allow the gay students to go to the governor's house <laughs> for pancakes and maple syrup. <laughs> So we lost out, and uh, but in the end, it turned out all right because uh, now we have the pancake breakfast, the annual pancake breakfast. So uh, we probably got more out of more mileage out of it by losing the bid than we would have by winning it. Thank you so much, and I had not known the that great detail about the the pancake. Uh, the syrup was coming from his own trees in Orford. That just is <laughs> a wonderful, wonderful addition to the story. Um, and just for the folks on the call, uh, I, I am chronologically sort of in the middle of our colleagues from the 70s. I started at UNH in 1988. The uh, sexual orientation had just been added to the non-discrimination policy in 1988. And my first day on the job, I came out to my new boss who said, I don't care, but don't tell the admin because it's hard to get good help at $5 an hour. <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> that was my welcome to UNH. Uh, fast forward a little bit. Uh, we are going to show a little PowerPoint here in a sec. But I heard this. Uh, I was on a women's history, women's history panel. And I heard this story from someone who had been at UNH back in the 70s. And the punchline was, to me, we never got the pancake breakfast. So I decided then and there sitting on this panel that we would just have a pancake breakfast ourselves. We would throw ourselves a party and we would give ourselves prizes. And the very first pancake breakfast was in the entertainment center in the basement of the MUB. And uh, Brenda Whitmore, who may be on this call, brought somebody called Billy Ponders. Billy Ponders was one of the maintenance crew guys. He had a griddle and he was gonna do the, the pancakes. And so I'm always indebted to Billy Ponders for being an ally and showing up and being there for all of us. And right from the get go, allies were included and, and welcomed. It was, it was always an inclusive uh, event to look back and to celebrate the work of uh, Paul and Wayne and all those others that had come before. So with that said, I'm gonna just show a, a quick uh, little PowerPoint of some highlights in history. This slide here, it goes, it's a, obviously a cover of the New Hampshire from 1974 that shows that the GSO lost out on that breakfast uh, with the governor. 
and we'll go through these pretty quickly. I'll just try to keep up. This is the, the New York Times that shows that the uh, Supreme Court ruling that went in favor of the GSO back in 75. These are some buttons and uh, Holly Cashman, if you're on this call, these are actually my buttons. I found them, I still have them today. These are March on Washington buttons. And again, for history purposes, that wedding button up in the top, there was a, a large wedding at the March on Washington in 1987. And many of us thought that gay marriage would be legalized within about 10 years of that date. It actually mm. took 20 more than that uh, to become legalized. But you can see from these buttons, the connection between visibility and HIV and AIDS is very interconnected here. The reason we have coming out day in October every year is because the March on Washington in 1987 was in October. And that date now is the, the reason that we celebrate that every year. We used to have Blue Jeans Day. Those of you who were around back in the day, uh, this button on the April 18th in 1990 was a blue jeans button for UNH where students were encouraged to wear blue jeans in support of LGBTQ uh, folks. And it meant then people had to do to stop and think, if I wear my jeans today, I'm going to look like I support gay people. Is that what I want to do? And so it was very clever because it was a very subtle thing to get people to just stop and take stock. And the other button there is the original Safe Zones uh, button, which was a program I started for my PhD. Uh, so that's a, another story. Moving right along, though, the Pancake Breakfast started in 1992 to celebrate our forefathers and, and four people and has been running ever since. So we're running up on do the math on that. Oh my goodness, that's a scary thought. It's almost 30 years moving along. We went in the 1993, we took a large contingent of UNH students, faculty and staff down to the March on Washington in 1993. So there's some um, great UNH pictures of that as well. Ellen came out, some of you might've been on campus uh, in 1997, we were up in the Mob Theater too, packed. So we just packed the Mob, and had that uh, episode live streamed so that everybody could see it together. The Create Our Destiny Conference, which was a community building event uh, that took place at that same, same year, 1997. And then of course, moving on where we had Matt Shepard's uh, murder really. Um, so there was a lot of celebrations and a lot of um, acknowledgement of passing of uh, gay people in, in over years and years and Matt Shepard, we had a, a packed house in the, up in the Stratford room, the Stratford room you've already heard about where we um, celebrated his life. Uh, we've had the AIDS quilt come many, many, many times. This, this picture is probably from the third time. It got bigger and bigger over time, but they used the black in between there and the 1990 event that's on the, on the mall in Washington. This just is to remind us that gay marriage has only been legal since 2015. It, I don't know about everybody else, but it seems like it's been a lot longer than that. And certainly the, the ways in which it has become uh, recognized um, in everyday parlance, uh, I think has become very well established in a reasonably short amount of time. This is, uh, UNH has, has long been involved in events, again, celebrating and um, commemorating um, murders and other things that have happened to LGBT folks. This is a sort of bittersweet part of our existence is to always keep these things in the back of your mind in terms of safety. And so when the pulse shooting happened in Orlando, we brought this uh, banner out and we had people sign the banner right there in outside of T Hall. And we sent that down to, um, to be displayed in the area of the Pulse nightclub to let people know that UNH was standing strong with them. That was in 2016. And we wanted to acknowledge that we've come a long way, but the work continues. This is, these are headlines from just today, where the Arkansas lawmakers overrode Hutchinson's veto on the transgender youth bill. And Arkansas became the second state to ban transgender athletes from female sports teams. There are very concerted efforts across the country at the moment with various types of trans anti-trans bills basically around athletics and other aspects of people's lived experience. And so the work is never done. And so we have to acknowledge that this is literally today that, that that's happening. I'm gonna turn it over to Lou and, and Lou at this point, if you could uh, introduce yourself and we're gonna go into some current highlights and then we're gonna also um, turn it over to 
Caden to talk about their experience. Excellent. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Lou Butterfield Farrell. I use they, them pronouns. And I currently serve as the Associate Director um, in the Beauregard Center for Equity, Justice, and Freedom, um, for some of you formerly known as uh, the Office of Multicultural Student Affairs, or OMSA. Uh, we recently went through a name change. Um, so we just sort of wanted to give you a snapshot of what's been happening on our campus in the last several years um, and what's going on now. Um, and a big piece of creating a sense of community and sense of belonging for our students is our inclusive programs. Um, so we have a month long, actually it's happening right now, this is a part of it, um, our, our Campus Pride Month or Gaypril, a month long of a LGBTQIA um, events celebrating and um, discussing LGBTQ issues. In the fall, we have a uh, Gender Identity Awareness Week, which uh, really highlights uh, trans um, and non-binary folks and their experiences, National Coming Out Week, um, and a variety of other programs throughout the year. Um, going along with a community and a sense of belonging, it's so important for, um, for us to come together um, in solidarity. And a part of that is uh, student organizations. So we have several st different student organizations and we have representatives um, from them here today and they can speak to their experience. But we have uh, Trans UNH, uh, a transgender student organization, the QT, which is uh, for queer and trans students of color, um, and we have the Alliance, which is uh, the general LGBTQIA student um, organization. And then we also have a faculty and staff uh, group called uh, Tuesday Afternoon Group, or TAG for short. And these are so important um, in creating a sense of, of community um, for all of us um, uh, to come together. Um, and first and foremost, before I go into sort of um, some of the initiatives that have been happening um, on our campus, I do just want to uh, dovetail off of what Carrie said. And I, I just want to note that everything that we have implemented over the last couple of years has really um, been possible because of all the work that has come before us. And so um, many thanks to the folks, the panelists on this call, um, Wayne, Paul, Carrie, um, many of our students, Kaden, um, Bob Coffey, Ellen Semren, those are all folks who really laid the groundwork um, for us to do a lot of the work that we've done over the last couple of years. Um, so just to give you sort of um, an indication of some initiatives that have been happening over the last couple of years to help make UNH more inclusive for the LGBTQIA community, um, we have increased gender inclusive housing within our residential uh, life program. We have a chosen or preferred name initiative, which is, allows you to indicate a, a chosen name that may be different from your legal name. Uh, increased gender inclusive restrooms across campus. Um, we have affirming care from our health services and psychological and counseling services um, uh, offices. We have uh, affirming healthcare coverage for uh, students, faculty, and staff, which is so important in, in um, helping us stay healthy um, and safe. And then, of course, um, earlier than a lot of these initiatives, uh, partner benefits um, was so integral to um, much of what we did. Um, these are just some of the initiatives that um, that we're working on. Uh, it's it's been a lot of, of hard work over the last couple of years, but um, we and we have a lot of work to still do. Uh, but we're really excited and and. Um, want to take time to celebrate the fact that that these things have been achieved uh, to make UNH more inclusive. Um, and then so next we have the Campus Pride Index, um, which is a, an assessment tool that uh, many universities uh, use to gauge how LGBTQ in inclusive they are. And so this is a really extensive um, assessment that uh, we take every year and um, it gives us a rating and benchmarks us um, with many other campuses across the nation. Um, and so we uh, scored a 4.5 out of five stars, which is um, quite, quite boastful for the university um, and, and you know, just sort of shows the work that we have um, put in into trying to make UNH a more inclusive um, place to be. And in the terms of climate, I what I would say, uh, the university, we're, we're not unique in the sense that um, um, we're not exempt from bias. Um, that happens here just as it happens uh, across the nation um, on different college campuses. Um, and so uh, what's important to know is that, that it, 
exist within that context. Bias happens on UNH's campus, just like it does on a national level. Um, and so it's so important for many of the initiatives that we've, um, that we've put into place to be there because they create a environment of well-being, of a sense of belonging, and a sense of pride um, to be at UNH. And I do just want to give uh, a shout out to Deb Brienne, who helped um, really make, sh make the Campus Pride Index assessment happen for us. Um, so that was a very exciting, um, a very exciting project. And I think that's it for the slides. All right, so now I um, definitely want to throw it over to uh, many of our students who can sort of speak to what their experience of experiences have been like, what their involvement has been. Um, and I would love to start with our, our most recent alum, um, Kaden O'Day, who is the original founder of um, Trans UNH. So I will pass it over to uh, Kaden. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Caden. My pronouns are he, him, his, uh, and I was in the class of 2017. Uh, during my time at UNH, I was a Safe Zone student coordinator and I got to help uh, create and facilitate a lot of different trainings around LGBTQ plus identities and allyship for classrooms and departments. Um, I first joined the Alliance Exec Board my sophomore year in an effort to kind of get involved with the activism that was happening on campus at the time. Um, and that was a really great experience for me. And later on, I went on to uh, start Trans UNH uh, just as a way to kind of create a safer space for trans students in particular to kind of come together uh, to build community and support each other. Um, at UNH, I had really found a community that I felt like I could really be a part of, which wasn't something that I had gotten to experience very much before college. Um, I immediately gravitated towards the groups and events that kind of spoke to the queer experience at UNH. Um, and I had found that even with those, there was still a strong need for that type of space for trans students specifically to get together, to have that type of support in a, a safer space. Um, a lot of times there are conversations around trans issues that don't go much deeper than a trans 101, um, which don't get me wrong, trans 101 topics are really great, definitely something to speak on. Um, but for trans students, it's important to have um, a space where you can kind of dig into just the day-to-day -day experiences of being a trans person and being a trans student on campus and kind of dig into those types of things. Um, so I started that in 2014 and then in 2015 we actually were recognized by the university as a student organization, um, which gave us the opportunity to start holding uh, educational events on campus as well. Um, and that kind of was in an effort to create a more welcoming and inclusive environment on campus in general, um, so that we know we can have our safe space here in this room with this group, but after we leave that we wanted to make sure that uh, we were doing what we could to kind of help those students go out and be as successful as possible outside of the group. Thanks for that, Kaden. And thanks for all of your hard work. It's so great to see you back. Yeah, it's great to see you too. I'm really excited to, to be back <laughs> virtually. Wonderful to have you here. Thank you. I think we'll, we'll go to, uh, to Michael and then uh, throw it over to you, Sydney, okay? Hi everyone, my name is Michael, I use he, him pronouns, and I am actually the current president of TransUNH. And I wanted to just sort of say that I'm really thankful for the work that Caden put in because as I entered uh, UNH, I wasn't really sure where I fit in. I was lucky enough to run into TransUNH on U Day and Dukebox, and um, it was the first organization that I've ever been a part of that was genuinely just focusing on the trans experience. And as Hayden said, trans on one is always great, but I've never found a space that I could actually dive deep into like the, a lot of the more, I guess, higher level um, concepts that come with being trans. Um, it was just so wonderful to see that and the work they put in was fantastic. And luckily, trans is still going strong to this day. I'll pass it on over to Sydney. Hi, uh, thank you, Michael. My name is Sydney. I am one of the two co-chairs of Alliance. Um, I use they, them pronouns. I'm non-binary. I sort of identify as just like a queer person in general. Um, so I have been on the Alliance exec board since my 
the end of my freshman year. Um, and yeah, I'm a junior this year, which is really crazy to think about. And I've like had a really good crew helping me along the entire time. One of my like favorite events that we got to participate in was the 20th anniversary of uh, Drag Ball, uh, where last last year uh, before everything that you know was going on. But um, yeah, it's just like really heartening to see a community come together um, to see people like bring donations. We um, got clothing donations for Seacoast outright um, in 2019 the drag ball was voted like event of the year or something um, with uh, former chair like Jake Lidipo at the head of it. And I just feel like there's so much Alliance has done to build a community, like not only in like small niches, but just all over the place. Like our office in the MUB has like, at this point, decades of history in it. Just today I found, um, a ticket for an event from 2009, which is crazy to think about because uh, I don't know if this might make me seem super duper young to some of you, but I was only nine in 2009. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I was born in 2000. So it's, uh, it's just really great to see how far we've come, you know, as a community. Thank you so much, Sydney. And one of the things that I, I just want to pick up on, I'm sure it's pretty obvious, it, it, is that UNH impacts our students, obviously, right? The students do the work, they're, they're there for each other, they're trying to create community, create a sense of belonging. That's also true for faculty and staff. And I see several faculty and staff that, I, that I've known for years on the list of, in, of attendees. So there's that ripple effect of community for, for faculty and staff. But we've also talked about Seacoast Outright, which is a support group for LGBTQ youth that started with quite a number of people from UNH. We created that at the Respect for All Youth Conference in the MUB in 93 and worked with PFLAG, particularly the Exeter branch of PFLAG. So a lot of allies worked with us on that. Again, a ripple effect out so that some of those, some of those kids, basically the, the youth that I used to work with in Seacoast Outright are now, are now working for Chris Pappas and, and our 40 year old people. And so, you know, we've, we've spawned a whole generation of people who had grown up who cared about them in that very out way that my generation certainly never had. And I think, you know, Paul and others have mentioned that, that that wasn't our experience prior to certain times. So I hope that we can enjoy this ripple idea that comes out of all of this wonderful work that everybody's been doing. And it's really uh, wonderful to hear these um, common themes. I'm getting some questions and I uh, just wanna mention, somebody's asking about the Campus Pride Index and uh, specifically, what are the criteria for that? And Lou, if maybe you could speak to that a little bit and, and we can get the person's name off the chat and get them specific information because they'd like to uh, make sure that they incorporate some of those ideas into their classroom, which is exciting. I had to find my uh, unmute there. Um, so the uh, I, I don't remember how many questions there are specifically, but I know that there are. It's an extensive assessment where it asks everything from campus safety to uh, residential living to um, academic experiences in the classroom to. Um, asking about um, what we provide in terms of health and wellness. Um, and coverage for, for students to just general um, campus climate. And so it's it's quite extensive and, and I can, I, I have a copy of, of um, what our answers are. So I'm happy to, to send that out to folks. Um, I think you can, if you go on the Campus Pride Index website, I believe that you can sort of look at our score and then sort of look where we, um, we scored higher um, or, or lower in some sections. Um, but it's, it's quite extensive. It's, um, I don't know, it has to be like 30 questions long. So um, uh, it's a, a, a very well done assessment. So thank you so much for that question. And we also did get a question about the Lavender graduation. We do have a Lavender graduation in Manchester and we celebrate our students in Durham in a number of ways when it comes to graduation. Uh, so that I, I thank you for that question. I'd be interested to, to go back to, to Paul and, and Wayne and 
when we were preparing for this, we talked about ways in which this experience that you had, this, this seminal experience at UNH, um, what impacts, looking back, would, would you say that had provided to you? What were, what were the takeaways for you as you went on into your adult life and uh, leaving UNH? Well, one thing I want, to, I, I want to mention before I get into that answer, the federal district court in Boston ruled in November of 1973, and the university had always presented this the case against the gay student organization was that they were uh, they were promoting uh, they had every right to regulate a student organization and what the what the district what the district federal district court in Boston ruled was that you 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 have to treat basically the bottom line was you have to treat everybody equally you can't you can't treat one organization differently you can't say that they can't do it because you know whatever, if the football team can do it, then the gay student organization can do it, whatever. So the university changed their tactic. They developed an entire case directed by the state government that homosexuality was a disease. And because this organization was promoting a disease, we had every right to regulate them. December 12, 1973. The American Psychological, Associ Psych Psychological Psychiatry Association removed homosexuality from its disease list and completely took the argument away from the, the university. And that's, uh, that's really when the university uh, or the state, as Wayne said, they kind of just withered away in its argument against the gay student organization. To answer your question, the dance was a defining moment for me. And months after I had addressed the board of trustees, I was handed a picture. I was speaking to trustees and behind me was Wayne and the entire organization. And I realized it was a defining moment in my life. It awakened in me what I had hidden all of my life. And, be, and I was extraordinarily fortunate in that I had a family who totally supported me. Uh, and the rest is history. But it also taught me to be passionate about anything I believed in. And I have never, never forgotten that. And I have, I have fought for human rights of, <laughs> Ever since, whenever the opportunity arises, I marched with uh, with kids from Parkland in uh, Gainesville, Florida. They came up to Gainesville, and I marched with uh, Joe and I went up and marched with the University of Florida. Uh, I marched with kids in Las Vegas uh, because the that Baptist church from Kansas came out to protest because they were doing a gay play. And <laughs> any opportunity we marched for gay marriage in. Uh, San Diego. And I remember why we lost Proposition 8. Remember the Supreme Court in California ruled that gay marriage, they couldn't, they could not stop it. And Joe and I got married in July of 2008. And then the evangelicals put, to, put forth this uh, Proposition 8 in California to override it. And it passed 52 to 48. Uh, 51 to 49, it was only like one or 2%. And really the reason it, it, we didn't win was because we were afraid to present ourselves as what we were, which was no different than anybody else. The uh, Mormon church spent $17 million in California to get Proposition 8 passed. They went into churches up and down the state convincing people that we were going to go into schools and, and, and promulgate homosexuality. And we didn't, you didn't see any ads where there were gay parents with children, gay parents, gay men and women involved in community affairs, involved in government. You didn't see any of that. We were afraid. And what changed after that? And what, it, what is very much 
the future is that we are no different in terms of our impact on society, our impact on our community. Joe and I have learned that in every area that we've lived in, in the friends that we've made, straight and gay, because we don't, we don't make any pretense about who we are and we interact with everybody. And only through that alliance, everybody, we, that, that we're going to make progress because the future for each one of our groups, for each one of our intertwined groups, and it is everybody, it is, it is Black Lives Matter, it is every single minority group in the country voting. What is happening in this country right now is the linchpin to us maintaining what we've accomplished and moving forward with much more that we need to accomplish. We don't, if we don't, what happened with this last four years was, will repeat itself and we can't afford to have that happen. Um, thank you for that, Paul. I'm looking at the, uh, the questions and trying to make sure we get these in here. One question was, who was the Dean of Students at the time, 1973? <laughs> this is interesting. The, genius, the Dean of Students was Bonnie Newman. Bonnie Newman went on to become an advisor to Ronald Reagan. She coordinated the design of Air Force One, the new Air Force One that is currently in use today. Uh, Bonnie went on to be an interim president of the University of New Hampshire. Yes, she did. And she almost became a United States Senator. And where was Bill Kidder in this? Because was it Bill, was Bonnie not the Dean of Students for Women and Bill was Dean of Students for Men? Maybe you can- help. Bonnie was the Dean of Students. Dean, uh, Bill was an uh, Assistant Dean of Students or Associate Dean of Students. And uh, uh, Dick Stevens was the Vice Provost for Student Affairs. Uh, there were a couple of other people that were, were involved in all of this. Uh, Greg Sanborn was uh, in residence. David Bianco, yep. who founded the transportation system, CAP. He founded that transportation system in 1974. Mm -hmm. uh, and David founded uh, Elder Hospital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, yeah. So <laughs> which, became, uh, which became Rhodes, Rhodes, Rhodes Scones. Rhodes Scones. Yes, right. Um, and uh, David passed away a few years ago. He was a dear, dear friend of mine. He, uh, but David was very involved as well. And okay. Greg Sanborn and uh, Ed, uh, Ed, Robin, Ed uh, Robinson, uh, some great people. And so to tie this back again to so many, uh, looking at the, the names on the list that I recognize at least, we have quite a span of timeframes at UNH. If you've been at UNH since we started the pancake breakfast, we decided we'd have the pancake breakfast in honor of our four people here who hadn't had one. And we threw ourselves a party and we had prizes that we made up ourselves. Bill Kitter in the meantime, uh, passed away and in his will left money as part of his legacy to provide some support for people who are doing this LGBTQ work on campus. And so that became the Bill Kidder Award as part of the legacy. And we've now had 30, almost 30 years of Bill Kidder Award recipients over the time. And so uh, for the younger, in terms of chronology folks who have heard Bill Kidder's name, hopefully that helps to put him in perspective because he was actually a staff member throughout this whole era and was uh, involved behind the scenes in supporting Wayne and, uh, and the efforts that were going on at the time. Again, I'm looking here at the... Uh... Terry, I believe Caden is an award recipient of uh, the Bill Ketter Award. Excellent, congratulations, Caden. Yes, thank you, 2016. 2016, <laughs> all right. I, I, I was... I don't remember how far back I kept, I was exempt because <laughs> I was on the committee because <laughs> we made up the committee. So at some point people realized, well, wait a second, 
you must have it by now. At some stage, you must have got one. And I said, no, because I've always been, you know. <laughs> so anyway, I was honored in that same way. So uh, it's, it's good to, to have that acknowledgement. Uh, somebody's putting in here that they're really happy to hear that TransUNH is still going strong. So shout out to TransUNH, well done. Um, happy to answer any other questions that people have. Um, other, you know, Caden, perhaps you could answer that question looking back, are there things about your, yourself? I, mean, I know you've mentioned some of your evolution through your time at UNH, but this activism that you were involved in, leadership development, arguably that you uh, were able to take from your creation of this organization and the work that you did, how do you think it's changed you and, and how are you bringing that to your, to your current lived experience? Yeah, thank you. That's a really great question. Um, I think that UNH is where I really kind of found the drive and empowerment to get involved with activism in general. Um, and I think, you know, based off of those experiences that I had, it, it felt as though what seemed at a small time was a small community doing things here and there, it really made a really big impact. And that kind of put that all in perspective uh, for me, on how those things can uh, make a difference. Um, so I think it was my experience with this at UNH that uh, was the way that I really found my voice as a trans person in this world. I don't think I would have um, maybe found that as quickly or in the same way if I hadn't had those experiences. Um, so personally, I've kind of carried that with me outside of UNH to find ways to make small impacts like that in the community. Um, for me, my kind of niche in that has been working with queer and trans youth. I've worked for a couple organizations um, that specifically cater around supporting that population. Um, and you know, it, some of my friends from, from back when in UNH could probably vouch for me for this, um, but the first few times that I was in college and I, I met an adult trans person for the very first time, I straight up just started crying uh, because for me, um, I, I had never met an adult trans person before. I didn't know what that would look like or that that was even an option um, for, for trans people to grow up and have positive, happy, successful lives, which they absolutely can. Um, so for me, working with youth, even if you can kind of give them a way to kind of see that for themselves and that type of empowerment that there is a future for them. Um, I think that in itself is a form of activism and resistance. I think that's that mirrors my experience as far, as far as finding your voice. Um, you know, the college years are uh, a seminal time for a lot of people. I mean, they're leaving their homes with all the dynamics that go along with it. <laughs> and, uh, striking out for the first time independently. And uh, I know when I went to UNH, um, I was very shy. Uh, I had very uh, poor self-esteem. And uh, in fact, uh, after two years, I left the university um, because I was uh, so depressed about where I was going and what I was doing and what kind of person I wanted to be, that kind of all those kind of questions that come up at that age. Um, and uh, after a year, I came back, and that's when I did the, the GSO stuff. It just kind of happened. I found my voice. I think that's so interesting, and I think it's a common theme. Is uh, the title of my dissertation is about you know living life authentically, basically for those of us who are LGBTQI, and that I I would hazard a guess would be for any person who's trying to embody a minoritized body in some way, shape or form. It's a challenge to try to be your full and whole self when you're being controlled in some way, right? And, and yet it frees us up when we, when we decide, I'm just gonna be me, which is easier said than done for some of us. And, um, and I really am inspired by that. Uh, I came to the US as an immigrant in the mid eighties and that was the pledge I made to myself. You haven't left everybody you know and love behind to not be yourself. You could have done that if you wanted to stay home. <laughs> you know, the reason to, to leave was to, to have that opportunity. So you better grab it by the horns and make the most of it. So um, I, I, I hope, uh, and this gives me great hope. I've seen it myself, uh, ahead of myself, right? Before me and, and since all of this wonderful work and all of these in, inspiring uh, people who are living in their true in their truth, and uh, I'm so happy for that. In the 
in the chat, we have David Moulton and Rick Khalil. I don't know if those names ring a bell with you, Paul and Wayne. But they, yeah. they were, I don't know what era they're in, but they're talking about being back in the dance. And so I, I believe they're referencing uh, some of your dances there. And uh, well, just- They were my contemporaries. <laughs> they're your contemporaries. Well, they're, they're, sit, they're with each other and they're really excited to be uh, strolling back down memory lane with us, uh, with us right, right now, which is exciting. Uh, and they did say that that would be okay for me to give them a shout out. I also want to acknowledge that there are many, many people on the list who've been involved and who've been allies and who've been supportive of lots of movements over time. We're going to end with a slide about the pancake breakfast and Allison is there on the line getting ready for tomorrow because tomorrow is our annual pancake breakfast uh, event. And so hopefully you will come back tomorrow and uh, hear who will be celebrated this year for their work at, uh, at UNH. There you go. So it's uh, nine to 10 in the morning and that's Eastern Standard. I know we've got uh, Paul and Wayne who are not in this time zone. So we, we are thankful for them for being here in the different time zone, but uh, there it is. You can register. And if you just go to UNH, the websites, you'll be able to find this information. I'm reading the question. What would each of the panelists suggest for what allies can do to make UNH even more inclusive and supportive of LGBTQIA plus members of our community? This is from one of our uh, faculty who is saying that they're really um, inspired by the progress, but recognize there's work to be done. And so asking how might they be able to help? I think I can start us off with that because um, I was just thinking about it. Um, the biggest thing you could do is to show up for various organizations and the various events that organizations put on. I remember my freshman year, Trans UNH put on the Won't Be Erased rally, which was a campus-wide rally um, combating something that was said um, by the then President Trump um, that was uh, just sort of like erasing us from history books, erasing us from like existence, writing us out pretty much. And there was a big turnout, which was really great. So just Turn out when you know there's an event. Um, keep an eye out for events. Go to organizations in the DSC like Alliance um, that are open. Just keep an eye out and come out. I think something else um, is to be an ally, um, even when it's not easy, even you know when it's hard, when you could face backlash for it. Um, because frankly, you know these are our identities this is how we live life you know that's it's frustrating to me um that there are people who don't sort of like reflect their allyship in everyday life and I think the best thing for allies or aspiring allies to do is to you know speak up because there are a lot of people on campus who have a lot of like hateful things to say and the best way to shut them down is is to just be like listen this is you're just wrong you know <laughs> it's frustrating i'm sorry it's just it's Good. frustrating to deal Good. with but that gets right to the point so it it does right. <laughs> we have a question about the theme for the 20th anniversary drag ball so um it was, you know, looking back, it's very ironic that we picked it. Um, it was the Roaring Twenties. Um, so it was kind of the, it goeth before the fall sort of. <laughs> They're going to roar guessing. again though. <laughs> yeah. I'm confident. They're going to roar again. <laughs> we have another question. Uh, Wayne, were there women involved in the GSO? Oh, yeah. Um, yes. It, it was, uh, there were fewer than the men, but there were definitely women very involved. And, um, but they were torn. A lot of them were torn because they were active in the gay, uh, I mean, the women's liberation uh, activities. And so they felt like they had a foot in both camps, but their primary foot was in the women's lib activities. <laughs> so a lot of them took a back uh, background kind of role. But after I left, um, the women pretty much took it over. So, um, and I don't know if there's anybody here that remembers those years, but. Uh, well, when we did bring, uh, to tell the audience this, when we did bring our founders back and Wayne came back and then um, we connected with Paul, we had Annie Philbin was here and Roma 
or Rona, I don't remember her Rona. last name. So, Rona, Rona there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Rona, they came back. And so we celebrated our founders in that way. So definitely a, a well-rounded group um, then and now. Okay. I'm getting, uh, just to share this with the panel, I'm, I'm watching the chat and looking for the questions and I'm seeing some really lovely comments from people who are so appreciative and inspired by your stories and your thoughts and your being here and all the hard work that you're all doing. And so uh, I just wanna make sure as a moment to acknowledge that uh, great energy, a lot of positive energy. Uh, you're freezing on us. I think Carrie just froze. <laughs> oh, am I back? You're yeah. back. Oh dear, not a not a good way to end. <laughs> it's telling me my internet is unstable. Life in Zoom, eh? Uh, so yeah. I think we're we're right up against time. Um, I'm looking to JC and to Paul just to make sure I don't go over. If uh, is that right? I think we're right up against time. So we want to give a shout out again to the pancake breakfast. Hey, you, I you're all set on time. I believe we're scheduled at 8.15, but oh, I think perfect. perfect. Okay. you're okay. Correct me if I'm wrong, JC. Okay, that's perfect. Well, so let's turn, turn to the panel then. Let's see who else would like to uh, add anything. Lou, thoughts? What's this bringing up for you? Yeah, I mean, um... I think just going back to the the allyship uh, question, which was, was such a good question. Um, I, I love everything that everyone said so far. Um, I think um, getting to know people's experiences and, and what makes them authentically them, um, learning about their lived experiences, um, obviously have a relationship with them before you start asking questions. Um, but really, you know, if you care about somebody, you, you will wanna know, um, parts of their this identity as well you're, you're going to want to know um, their whole self so um, you know ask questions and get to know people um, and what makes them authentically them um, and beyond that I think also just trusting people in their experience um, for a lot of LGBTQ people it takes a long time to come to sort of um, to process and come to terms with um, figuring out our identities and so um, trust people when they tell you if they're coming out to you um, trust them in their experience um, and then sort of support them in that um, there's a lot that you can do I know that um, for a lot of folks it can be a lot to learn at first um, but be patient with yourself um, know that a part of allyship is going to be making mistakes so inevitably that will happen but um, learning from your mistakes is is the best way to learn so those are some thoughts I have on allyship Other well said, Lou. Other thoughts yes. from the from the group? Yeah, don't 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 be afraid to look anywhere for support. I mean, we're all very proud of who we are, and and everybody has to smile like Michael does. This is he's got the greatest smile, and it just exudes confidence. Um, and because we are proud of him. And, you can change people's minds just by being yourself. When Joe and I first moved here, we live in Ocala, Florida now, very rural, very redneck, <laughs> a little bit, a little bit different, a lot of Republicans. Um, and in 2016, we worked very hard for a certain Democratic candidate. And um, on the day of the election, we worked the polls and one of our neighbors was working the polls for the other team. And a very uh, redneck Southerner. And the day after the day after the election, she came down and stood in front of our house and called us the F word and told, asked us when we were going to leave because now that so-and-so was gonna be president, people like us could be thrown out. We had to have a sheriff come to get rid of her. Had to threaten her with 72 hours of, of being committed for 72 hours to get her off our property. A year later, 
that woman came down the street after Hurricane Irma. And I said, oh my God, what is she coming to see us for now? And she came into our yard and she said, can I talk to you? And I said, yeah. She said, I was wrong. You're no different than anyone else who lives here. You and Joe are just the same as all of us. I was wrong and I need to hug you. I was absolutely stunned, but we didn't do anything. We never, we really didn't have any contact with that woman for that entire year. But we lived in the same neighborhood and she saw us and, and we live our lives like anybody else. Well, and remember, people uh, do take notice of that. Yeah. I remember back in the day, um, there was a Boston politician named Elaine Noble. Uh, I believe she was the first uh, gay person or lesbian person in the state legislature um, at the time. And it was, she broke a lot of barriers. But anyway, somebody asked her once, you know, what's the most radical thing that you're going to do or can do? Um, and she said, the most radical thing any person can do is to come out to the people who they're closest to, the people right around them. Because that is where you have the most impact and the most uh, chance of changing people's minds is the people who love you and know you. And she credited the fact that she was able to come out as a healthy um, lesbian because she came out to her parents and they accepted her. Um, now that doesn't mean everybody is going to accept you, um, but that's just a, a chance you have to take. I think this is such, such an important message. It, and it reminds me when the staff were trying to get, part, staff and faculty actually were trying to get partner benefits back in the day, it took us 12 years in part because we didn't quite understand the rules of the game. We weren't sure how the committee structure worked at the trustees. We, we went down in flames at the personnel, personnel committee the first time we went up six to zero. We all went over in a bus and we had carabiners. I think I still have my carabiner. That was sort of our own little prize. We, we went up as links in a chain and gave each other carabiners as a memento of, of that. Um, so we, when we knew we were going to have to take another bite out of it, it was going to take another cycle through or whatever, we said, well, why don't we just sort of double team the trustees and tell our stories and, and share what this means to us? Because maybe they don't know any gay people. Maybe it's, it's sort of a theoretical thing and maybe they just need to meet us and get to know us. And I, I got to meet Walter Peterson, who was the former governor and former president of the university. He, I mean, he did a stint as the interim president and a very Republican and very principled person. And he listened to what we had to say and ended up siding with us on this because he said, it's fundamentally not fair. That was his assessment. It was that simple to him as a principled person. It wasn't fair. And so I think that part of the takeaway message here is that if we live our lives in in out authentic ways that can be dangerous to some of us certainly at certain times at certain places, but it can also help to build bridges and it can help us to work with allies. But we invite to the question that was asked the allies to help work with us and to work together to allow us all to be our full and whole selves. And I think we have lots of examples of that across all of our supposed differences. Fundamentally, we all wanna love people, we all wanna be happy and together we can do that. And UNH, all of these stories that you're hearing tonight, uh, UNH has been a real beacon, a really shining beacon in this regard when it comes to LGBTQI rights and uh, we've all been a part of it. I see Mike Leavers on here. Mike is a, an alum. Mike, I'm dating myself. I, I don't remember your, <laughs> your year of graduation, but Mike is, is thanking us all for the work and he's out there doing the hard work himself, uh, writing up the stories of LGBTQ people in international settings. And uh, I follow his work and it's a uh, really amazing, amazing work. So thank you for being here. And thanks for everything you're doing. Other thoughts uh, to leave the group with? 
Well, you know, a few years ago, we, my partner and I took a little tour of New Hampshire and we went to Concord and, uh, and walked through the state Capitol building. It was uh, a year or more after uh, New Hampshire passed the gay marriage uh, law. And um, a secretary who was working there, it was very quiet because the legislature wasn't in session. <clears throat> But a secretary came out of the office and we were talking, we, we told her we were here for actually the pancake breakfast, uh, where I got that award yeah. back in 2012 or whatever it was. Um, and wow. she said, uh, yeah, she said that was a big moment here. She goes, it didn't look like it was going to pass, but she said a couple of the legislate legislators who are gay and in gay relationships and have children and so forth and so on really swung the vote around because the people that were ostensibly against it in, in, the, in the state house uh, were swayed by their arguments because they knew them. And uh, that's why it passed. And I said, geez, small world. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, other parting thoughts, Michael? You're good. <laughs> Keep up the good work. Will I see you, I'll see you tomorrow, Sydney? I just wanted to say that I, I think it's really important that we ultimately have compassion for ourselves um, as well as others, especially when it comes to this kind of thing, because we're all just people. Uh, at the end of the day, our identities might be different, but um, you know that that can be sort of any issue. We're all just people trying to exist in this world like anybody else and there's nothing wrong with individuality and there's nothing wrong with value, valuing, pardon me, um, everybody's individual lived experience. So thank you. Good. It's great. It's great. So uh, personally, I wanna thank each and every one of you for your time. Thank, thank you for your stories. Thanks to everyone who signed in. I think that we had over, I don't know, 90 or something people on the call at one point. Uh, so that's a really great turnout. It's so wonderful to see so many allies and so many LGBTQI folks that had been out while they were here and are going on to do wonderful work in the world. Uh, I truly hope that you will continue to share your stories with us. Tell us how UNH has shaped you and made you the person that you are today and be proud. Be proud of yourself and who you are. And we're all still here for you, uh, those of us who are working on campus. And so I'd say Jen Woodside and Paul and JC and those who work, uh, Susan Entz and those who work in alumni, uh, the Alumni Association. Um, we have people in advancement, of course, who always would love to hear from us, uh, from the alums. Uh, so I will put a plug, shameless plug, I'm a dean after all, that the uh, 603 challenge is starting this Friday and uh, we would be delighted for you to support the work that we're doing uh, in terms of LGBT work and uh, the grad school too, uh, grad students uh, could uh, certainly benefit from any support that you would be willing to, to give. Um, this work is important and it continues regardless. So we hope that this gives you an exciting uh, opportunity to take a stroll down memory lane, to be really, really proud of UNH and everything that we've done. Some of you may not know this, but Wayne and Paul were featured in a PBS special called We'll Meet Again, and that was done by Ann Curry. There were two seasons uh, of that show, We'll Meet Again, and this is episode six of season one. If you're a member, if you got a passport on PBS, I believe you can get that show on their website. And we also have a link here to the story of the Gay Students Organization in a piece that was done in the UNH magazine. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Please stay safe out there, take care of yourselves and uh, continue on with pride.